Okay, let's try that one again. Um, okay, so I'm going to take a little bit of a different approach and speak um, about epidural stimulation. So unlike stem cells, I guess this is coming from the other side of the spinal cord. This is something that happens uh, low down. And really, um, we're covering this because, like the stem cells, there's been a lot of... This has taken all forms of different headlines. A little, uh, I guess, from you know all over the world being North America and England as well. And this goes everything from paralyzed baseball star steps into medical history, wind on my legs. This has taken all forms of different headlines. A little, uh, I guess, from you know all over the world being North America and England as well. And this goes everything from paralyzed baseball star steps into medical history, wind on my legs, can stand and move his legs again. And so this really got worldwide coverage, starting back in 2011, with the results of, again, similar to what Peggy showed you, the results from one case study. This has been followed up more recently, where they actually repeated this now and looked at an additional three individuals. So really what I want to do in this presentation is try and cover the results from two very high-profile publications that have appeared. The first one, which was published in The Lancet back in 2011, and then this one, which almost repeated what this did in an additional three individuals, again, in a very prestigious journal. And I'm not going to separate these two in the results. I'm simply going to try and bring the results together to give you a kind of overall idea of what both of these studies show. And again, there's some information on your tables about this as well. And so who did they test? Well, they took four individuals. As you'll all learn as you get into research, these four individuals lose their name as part of this, so they're given initials. Um, and then effectively, these are all what we would probably class as the chronic period post-injury, so between two and four years after injury. And they all had a relatively high spinal cord injury, so all above T5 and as high as C C7. One of the things that we measure as well when we're testing not only the level of the injury, is how complete the injury is. So like Peggy said, we're trying to look to see whether any of those axons are still present connecting the brain to the lower part of the spinal cord. And so this is given um, three or four different designations. Anywhere you see an A or a B, this implies that there is no testable motor function. So no functional ability to move the legs or anything below the level of the injury. The differenti differential between an A and a B is that if you have a B here, it means you can sense below the injury. So you can feel below the injury, but you're still un unable to move. And so you can find this picture pretty much all over the internet now. These are the four individuals. Currently, this is being done in the US, in, in Kentucky, uh, and it's the only site that is currently looking at this, uh, at this therapy. And so, similar to the previous uh, work that Peggy just showed you, they didn't start by doing this epidural stimulation. Before they even got implanted with this, there was a very long period of time where they had to go through rehabilitation. And so what did this look like? So they did something called body weight supported treadmill training. So we actually have a similar study with Dr. Krasikov running over at i -Cord not from epidural stimulation, but looking at the effectiveness of just doing this type of therapy. So what happens is the individual with spinal cord injury is placed in a harness. This harness is fully supporting the body weight. And then you have two, three, four, sometimes five individuals that are moving the legs as the treadmill turns. So they're facilitating walking. And what was required to take part in this study is that they had to complete anywhere between 80 to 170 sessions before being implanted. Now, what does this look like? This is, turns out to be around 108 hours of step training, 54 hours of stand training, and took two years to complete. And the real idea behind this was what you're looking at here is effectively we're measuring muscle activity. So if you see a straight line, this means no activity is present in either the right or left leg in any of the major muscle groups. If there were spikes like this, that would indicate that there is some activity present. And this is the measurement made after 170 step sessions. So really showing that just this therapy on its own is not having any improvement on muscle activity below the level of injury. Yeah, I'm going to get there just now. And so what did they do? And so what they did is they implanted this epidural stimulator. And so what is this? Effectively, this is a small array of electrodes which is placed just on the surface of the spinal cord. It's placed very low down in the spinal cord, around the T12 vertebra. But it covers many different levels of, spinal cord in, of the spinal cord. So what this means is the nerves that come into the spinal cord to take the information to move to the legs and to the toes and to the ankles 
is all around this one region here. And this is what they're putting the epidural stimulator over. So effectively what this is doing is, is a way they can create effectively electricity to stimulate um, the area around the spinal cord. The important point here is what it's not doing is this is not sufficient on its own to cause the muscles to contract. So all this is, is doing is effectively exciting or increasing the activity in the spinal cord. But it alone is not stimulating the muscles. So that's been done many times before where you can directly stimulate the muscles. This is different. This is just increasing the activity in the lower part of the spinal cord. This is then connected via a wire. And then there is a, I guess, like a small command center, if you like, which is placed just under the skin. And then this is able to be communicated to through a futuristic handset. Um, it looks a little like an old Game Boy. And effectively, you can control the parameters, so the location where you're stimulating, the intensity of the stimulation, and the frequency of the stimulation. And so once they had that implantation, they then had to go through a period where they did some optimization. So one of the things with this kind of stimulation is there's probably over, there's hundreds of thousands of different combinations that you can use. And trying to find the optimal way to stimulate is very, very difficult. And as it turns out, and as what we'll see, is actually the optimum way to stimulate for standing is different from the optimum way to stimulate for trying to assist with walking and so on. And so they go through a period of around two weeks where they will try and optimize the stimulation parameters for things like standing, um, as we'll see for cardiovascular function and for things like assisting with walking. And so here's some videos. Now, these are taken from the second publication. And these, this video here is going to show you uh, the ability to stand. Now, this is the first time that this individual tried it. So he's only two weeks post-implantation at this point. There's been no real practice for this, but this is just the first time he tried it. And so a couple of important points you can see. Here they're increasing the voltage, so the current of the stimulation, until they get to the point where it's around optimal. So now these are independent, he's standing independently, these are just there in case of him falling. The body weight is being supported currently at 60%. And what you're going to see as he goes through this is this number getting less and less and less. So effectively this is reducing the amount of body weight support that this individual is getting all the way down until effectively 5%, which is considered independent standing. So again, this is the first time that they tried this. Over the course of 18 months, the ability to stand got um, c considerably better. But you know, all four of the individuals were able to achieve this at the first time that they tried it. And so he's now at 5% body weight support. And so just to give you an idea, this is that kind of array that I was talking about in the spinal cord. And they found what was optimal for standing was if you stimulate these lower, um, the lower parts of the array down here around the L4, the L5 spinal cord uh, level. The other major finding. Was the ability to move voluntarily. So you can. So these little things you can see on here are just recording. These are not providing any stimulation. This is with the epidural stimulator in place. So the epidural stimulator is on at a set frequency. And so unlike the other one, they found that in order to do this most effectively, you stimulate somewhere around the middle here. And so I guess this is one of the limitations with the current way we have this set up and something we'll discuss. But trying to optimize the stimulation parameters is different for every single person. And it's almost different for every activity they try as well. Down here is those same lines again. And where you see this movement here, this just confirms that we are indeed getting muscle contraction in the left leg here. And so they're really the major two findings. I just want to cover a couple of additional ones. 
three out of the four participants could grade force. And so this means when they were asked to do a low, a medium, or a high contraction, they could, they could respond appropriately with the relevant muscle activity. And then really outside of the motor system as well, almost exclusively everyone reported improved bladder and bowel function. All participants reported improved sexual function. And so we actually don't really have a very good idea of how this is working right at the moment. So there's a lot of scientists around the world kind of scratching their heads at the moment trying to figure this out. The best idea, and just to give you a little bit of insight here, is effectively the brain would normally send information down the spinal cord as we saw earlier. After injury, that information gets stopped. But what's probably happening is there's still some pathways, just very few, that are still running down the spinal cord. We're just unable to detect them with any of the clinical um, tests we have at the moment. And the idea being is if we then provide this stimulation down the bottom, effectively what we're doing is providing enough electricity here or enough of a stimulation to cause those muscles to move. So again, the epidural stimulator is not contracting the muscles itself. It's providing an environment in which some information that gets through can cause some movement. That's one of the theories that's going through at the moment. And so we're actually in a very fortunate position um, to be involved in this, uh, in this project. And we're taking some of those non-motor findings and really investigating uh, the effect of this epidural stimulation on some cardiovascular parameters. This is done in collaboration with Dr. Kraskov and Aaron Phillips, who are both in the audience today. And effectively, um, what we're doing is we're measuring blood pressure. So this is beat by beat blood pressure whilst an individual is laying down. We then sit the person with spinal cord injury up and there is a drop in blood pressure, something we call orthostatic hypotension. You can follow just the average blood pressure with the red line here. And as you can see, blood pressure drops in the sit-up position, often associated with dizziness and lightheadedness. When we turn the stimulator on at this point here, blood pressure rises back up and those symptoms of dizziness disappear. So effectively, we can improve blood pressure control. And this is an acute response. There's no training involved here. This is just simply turning the stimulator on. And just kind of to summarize, where are we at? Now, taking those findings from those four, there's another two that have already been implanted. So the six to date. There's actually plans now to implant another 36 individuals over the course of three years at roughly one a month. Uh, we're expanding the study to also include more specifically the effects of stimulation on the bowel, bladder, sexual, and respiratory function as well. Uh, and just as I thought I'd put this in as a, an interesting aside is that the funding for this study is it's obviously requires a lot of money, and actually it's still not fully funded yet. So we're still working on that to try and get to the point where we can implant 36. And just in the interest of education, I thought I would put across a few uh, potential problems here as well. So far, we don't have any good idea of the long-term effect of placing these epidural stimulators on the spinal cord. We don't have a good idea of what it's doing to the tissue, and with current ways, it's not very easy to study that effect in humans. And as I said before, the stimulated technology is actually very basic with little that can be modified. So there's people that are trying to work to improve the design and op uh, optimization, and there's a very high cost to participant uh, cost. And so this is really a summary of the project now. We have these four different groups. Uh, I fall in the cardiovascular group, of which Dr. Krasikov, who will be on the panel, is the, is the leader. It's all led by Dr. Harkima down in, um, down in Kentucky. And these are kind of the different groups that are coming together now to study the wider effects of this. Thank you.